Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, there's a lot of scriptures. I, I'm not going to pop them all up on the screen. You'll, you'll know most of them. But, you know, it says in the end times, it says, many will, you know, the love of many will grow cold. And that word, and that's in Timothy, and that, that word love is agape. So it's talking about the church. It says the, the agape love of the church will grow cold, and many will depart from the faith. And when I look at that scripture and I see what's going on, I do believe the church as a whole has grown cold. And we wouldn't be in the mess we're in if the church was hot. Can I get somebody to agree with me today? Amen. It's what I see. And, you know, and it's really a trip, trick of the, the devil because I'm thinking, man, how is that in mass, the love of God, going to grow cold when we should be so thankful every day for what God's done in our life? You know, we, we should live a thankful life. You know, we deserve hell and death, but we're going to get eternal life with Jesus Christ. And that, that should, man, just make us, th- that alone should make us thankful. If God didn't do anything else, amen, he's done enough, right? And I thought about how is so many people's love going to grow cold? And, and, and I see it. I see it happening. I, I saw the attack in my own life. Just when we look at the political structure of our country, and when we have Christians, man, just so angry with, you know, the, the other side of the political realm that they don't agree with, and then you have the other side just with so much hatred, man, and, and anger towards people and the violence that we see going on. And, and it's easy to slowly allow ourselves to have our love eroded, isn't it? I know it started to get on me. I was like, six years ago, I, can't, I canceled cable. I said, man, I can't take this no more. I'm not watching this junk I'm not, and I was talking about the news. I wasn't even watching any. I don't have premium, so I didn't watch any of the other stuff you shouldn't be watching. But just, just that negativity, the anger, the angst. You know, we're watching people who really aren't committed and living their life for Christ are trying to get ratings, right? And so they have this whole thing pitted against each other and divided they conquer, right? So it's all a ploy of the, of the enemy. And I noticed in my own life, I started to get angry. I started to get a little bitter, a little cynical, you know what I mean, about what was going on. And I knew it was time to get back on my face to God and shut every other influence off and get on my face before a holy God and just cry out and say, God, tenderize my heart again. Soften my heart again. Bring me back to my first love. Lord, when I fell in love with you, when I got saved, when I got water baptized, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, God, when I spent hours and hours twisting wire together to make a happy birthday, Jesus. Lord, the things, the the extent, the sacrifice, the the things that we did because we were just so in love with you. God, restore that to the church. It's slowly being eroded away, God, the hardness, the the non-commitment to church, the running here, running there, running over there, the God of sports and the God of entertainment of this world, and the God of golf, and the God of, just let me go right down the line, the God of uh, entertainment, and we'll include all those things, whether it be sports or whatever it is. God, it's just consumed the church. And so, Lord, I pray for the break the back of the devil. Destroy, you've came to destroy the works of the devil. And God, I pray every believer, I pray every message I preach or every message they hear and whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking ruins them for the trip and the trap of the enemy, the bait of Satan. And so, Father, we stand here as ones today that recognize. See, you've got, you first have to recognize it before you'll admit it. And you have to admit it before you'll quit it. And so, Father, this morning, I just come in and I want to lead this congregation in repentance. God, I ask for forgiveness for where we've grown cold. I ask for forgiveness, God, where we've thrown some change at the, at the, you know, the altar or the, or the box, you know, the giving box, and, and thinking that we're okay. But, Lord, in the meantime, Lord, you, you see, are seated in the heavenly realm interceding for us and watching the coldness and the dryness. And, Lord, that spirit of entertain me that's entered the church. Forgive me and forgive us. Forgive our leaders. Forgive the church as a whole, God. And God, we ask that you restore, restore the years the canker worm has eaten. You said the day will come they'll have a religion with void of power. And Lord, we're seeing that. We're seeing it coming across the land. The lack of respect, Father. The all, the, 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 there's no fear of God. Lord, if there was fear of God in the church, God, I'm not talking about the world. They're not going to have it because they're not saved. 
But Lord, in the church, that lack of fear of God, Lord, the frivolousness, Lord, the, 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 the minor things that we make big deals out of, instead of just being so, Father God, overcome with your love and your goodness and what you've done in our life, that we would say, Lord, I'll do anything for you because you did everything for me. God, bring us back to that place, the simplicity that's gotten so complicated today, God. And you said the, the gospel is simple. A child can understand it. But we've complicated it, God. And so, Lord, I, I pray that the joy and the peace of God would once again fill the house. But, Lord, you've given us, you've given us some conditions to be met for that to happen. And so, Lord, may you use your servant today to bring glory, honor, and praise unto you and conviction where conviction's necessary, God, that only comes from the Holy Spirit. Lord, an uplifting, an encouragement, again, comes from the Holy Spirit. Just a vessel, God. And John 15 says we can do nothing without you. But then Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And thank you for those complimenting verses, God. And so have your way, God. Lord, strike at, the, at this very heart and soul of our issues. That, God, we would be shaken out of our complacency, shaken out of this going through the motions of church. God, I don't want to live like that. God, I don't want to live in a generation like that. I want to be in a place where people love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I want to, be the, I want to lead the way, God. I don't want to be one pointing fingers. I want to be one leading the way and saying, hey, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. And God is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father but through him. And Lord, we come against any other teaching that would say there's many ways, there's not many ways, there's one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. There's not many religions to the same path. There's one religion, and it's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And God, we praise you today. Incite every heart, put a fresh fire in every heart and soul today for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, I need your help. I cannot do this without you. Have your way. In your holy name we pray. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Yes, we give God praise. Praise God. The reformation of Josiah and 2 Kings 24, you can get ready to go there, but after David and after Solomon, there were about 19 kings over Israel, and all 19 were evil. All 19 kings, and oh, about 20 kings over Judah in that same time period, which there were only about eight that you could even say that weren't evil. There were several that really stood out. Two in particular, but one has kind of the, I guess, uh, the thing spoke the accolade of, of being one who was the most tender-hearted towards God since David. And at one point, God was bringing judgment, and I believe there was a final straw that took place. And so I want to look kind of at that and look at kind of the times it was taking place and so 2 Kings 24, I'd encourage you to read 2 Kings 22, 23, 24, along with 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles that are applicable. Your Bible will usually tell you where you can cross over to really get the full picture because I don't have time today to go through all those verses. But 2 Kings 24, verses 3 and 4. And this was kind of, to me, the straw that broke the camel's back. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight. So God was, you know, we're praying God correct the world and God's saying, no, I'm going to remove Judah out of my sight, my people. For the sins of Manasseh, I think he had one of the titles of one of the worst evil kings there was. According to all that he did, and we'll get to that in a moment. In verse 4 in particular, and it says, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. Now I want to give you a little bit of a background to what the main emphasis was on this verse. They were sacrificing their children, their infant babies, to a God called Molech. 
They were throwing them alive in the fire of the altars of Molech. Now you're talking about these infant children that were thrown into this fire to sacrifice for this false god. And you're talking about this is in Judah. This is the people of God that got caught up in this. And, and when I think about that, and, and I'm thinking, do you, I, you know, I read something. It said, since Roe v. Wade, we've murdered approximately 68 million babies in America alone. 68 million babies alone. When they would throw these children into the fire, they had these drummers and they would have the drummers play as loud as they could to drown out the screams of the babies that were being thrown into these fires so the parents couldn't hear the screams and maybe change their mind. This judgment that was about to come upon them was known as the Babylonian captivity, one of the worst captivities they had been in other than Egypt. But this judgment was averted for 31 years. God had had it. He was going to destroy them for the shedding of the innocent blood. And I thought, man, you know, 68 million is more than all the wars combined in America together doesn't equal the deaths of 68 million children. That's the greatest holocaust that's ever happened is, is, is the, the sin of abortion. Now, listen, God's forgiving if someone's been through that. Actually, almost all the leaders that run the uh, pro-life movement all have had abortions. And that's why they're so passionate against it. But God is a forgiving God. And he's raised these people up and he's using them mightily. So don't think there's no hope. That's not what I'm preaching here. But 31 years, this captivity was avoided, this Babylonian captivity, because of one man that had a tender, I should say one young boy, who had a tender heart towards God. One person who had a tender heart towards God would spark a reformation that would avert judgment for 31 years. Go to 2 Kings 22, verses 1 and 2. 2 Kings 22, verses 1 and 2. This is King Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Eight years old he became a king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidah, and the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. And listen to verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in all the ways of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left. It's also said that this judgment came because of the sins of Manasseh, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, but this young king Josiah, he's eight years old and starts to reign. And I started to read, Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather, who had the title of one of the most wicked kings who ever served in Judah. His father was Anan, who was just as wicked or almost as wicked as Manasseh. So this young man at eight years old came out of a house of evil. How good is God? How good is God, man, that he can take you from one side of the tracks and get you to the right side of the tracks, amen? Doesn't matter what color, where you were born, how much money you got. What matters is if your heart will be tender towards God. You can come out of the worst situation that you think couldn't, couldn't be any worse, and God could bring the greatest blessing. God could bring the greatest person that he could use out of the greatest, you know, or out of the worst evil, man. That's the God we serve. Help us, Lord. Help us. I want to describe to you what else was going on at this time, and I want you to see, see if, you, if you think this sounds familiar. So the main thing that broke the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, was the sacrificing or the murdering of babies. Innocent blood. Would anybody disagree that we're living in a time that we've shed more blood than they probably ever shed? To the God of convenience. It don't have to be God of Molech, it would be the God of convenience. The God of, of, of not interruption. The God of, uh, if I would do whatever I want. It's my body, it's my thing, it's this, it's that. No, it's not your body, it's a baby's body, but that's another whole subject. If you, if you actually believe my body, my choice, you'd never abort a baby. Because that baby should have the same thing that you're claiming. My body, my choice. Help us, Jesus. I want to describe what else was going on. There was false gods in the land, wizards and mediums. 
let's modernize it. Psychics and card readers, which a lot of Christian people, I hear, go to these things. Repent. Hallelujah. New Age practices had crept into the church. You see that all the time, man. Christians doing this stuff with the, the, not marbles, but they put the stuff in a bag and they shake it up. And I don't even research it because I don't, I don't have time for nonsense. I got time for Jesus, amen. They brought idols into, into the worship of the temple. Idols. You know, an idol is nothing more than something that you're looking towards more than God. Something that is in between you getting closer to God, that, that's an idol. You know, somebody wrote me a letter one time, and, and it was, they had had one or two abortions, and now they're like really big into pro-life. Um, they know they've been forgiven 100%. But they wrote a letter, and, and they, they titled it, and it said, The Idol of Self. And she, she wrote this whole thing, and it was, it was really beautiful, man about how we've made our self the idol because we want to do whatever we want to do and we don't care what anybody else says, including God and his word, because we contradict it all the time. I could get down the list, but I won't because I don't want anyone to get angry and miss what I'm really trying to say here. Not that I'm worried about that. I, I'm here to serve God. They brought in the idols and the worship. So if, if that's us and we're putting our feelings and everything else before God, then we're, and we come to church, we're bringing the idol of self into church. It doesn't have to be a statue or something that we create. It could simply be disobedience, lack of sacrifice. Come on, church. It, it's going to be heavy today, but that's okay. It needs to be heavy. They brought in entertainment into the church to replace true worship. My God, we're not seeing that today. Why in the world I need a fog machine when I got the Holy Ghost? And listen, I'm not, I'm not coming against things. People use all kinds of different things. But when it's taking the place of true worship, when it's entertaining me more than it's making me get on my face and cry out to God in brokenness and humility, then that's not God, church. And why in the world, when I'm called out of darkness into the light, would I paint my sanctuary black and turn all the lights out to be in the dark? It's okay, man. I know this is from the heart of God, so I don't care what anybody says. I don't, you, you get mad at me, leave. I'm, I'm so sick of the nonsense. You have no idea. Entertainment replaced worship. And that's the travesty. It's not the external things that we're looking at that you come against. The travesty is that it's robbing God from his worship. That's the travesty. That we're not before a holy God with our faces to the carpet and weeping before God. When a pastor has to stand up there and, and instruct you to clap for God, something's wrong with your heart, man. I'm not a cheerleader. I'm a preacher of the word of God. But I don't compromise it, and I'm not apologizing for it. Too late in the game for, those, for that stuff. Entertainment replaced true worship, and the altars of, of other gods were built alongside the altars of God. They brought shrines, and they, they brought in, check, the, the, this is how degrading it got. They brought in the temple prostitutes and the sodomites, or the homosexuals, they were in the temple prostituting themselves with the priest and the people who would pay. In the temple. Now you got to equate that's like church today. We got churches flying rainbow flags. There's something wrong with that. You're, you, you are hurting people. You're not helping people. And I'm not here preaching hate. And I'm not here preaching down on anybody. Sin is sin. Come on, church. But when it says it's an abomination to God and you start flying some flag that, that is promoting a lifestyle that's taking somebody to hell and destroying their life, that is not love. It's not God. So don't put his name on it over a church and say that it's God in the name of love when it's not love. True love cannot be void of truth. How can you say it's love when there's not truth to it? 
And again, I'm not preaching hate. I'm not preaching hate against somebody caught up in a sin of homosexuality no more than I would if somebody caught up in adultery or fornication, sleeping around when you're not married. That's going on in the church too, more than you think. I've had to correct people, and they just run to the church down the street. When I say down the street, I don't mean literally down the street. Don't try to figure it out. They'll run to these other places, and I'll run into them later. They're shacking up calling themselves a Christian, running around with the Christian t-shirts, the Christian bumper stickers. I'm like, you need to scrape that bumper sticker off, take the t-shirt off, get on your face and repent, and then maybe God will forgive you of your wickedness. Come on, man. Well, pastor, you got to be nice. No, I don't have to be nice. God did not call me to be nice. He called me to be loving, and he called me to be truthful. That's what he called me to be. Nice guys don't go to heaven. Saved, born again, washed in the blood, committed to Jesus, people go to heaven. Come on. That's who goes to heaven. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. And you'd never be good at all if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. And he didn't call you to mock God. He didn't call you to have a party spirit. Hey, after church, let's go over and break a keg. No, you ought to have your heart broken if that's your heart. Where in the world do you see in the scripture you're supposed to have a party spirit and call yourself a Christian? I'm tired of it, man. Go to this church for this, this church for that, this church for that. Well, I don't like what they said, so I'll run over here. They won't give me my way here, so I'll run over here. That's not God. When I got saved, we got on, the, on our face at the altar and said, God, where do you want me to be? The scripture says God appoints you to a body. Where am I supposed to be? Not what I like. A lot of times God will put you where you hate it because he's got to do something in your life to break something so he can use you. Come on, church, this is, the, this is real stuff here. This is basic 101 Christianity. And I'm not angry with you, so please don't take it that way. I'm just very passionate and, and needs to be said. It needs to be spoken because the big name preachers ain't speaking it. They don't want to hurt their money so they can't fly around in their jets. When a preacher gets in a pulpit and says, God told me I'm supposed to buy a jet, you're gonna, you need to repent, man. You need to repent. And you're going to take money from the people of God to get rich and not speak against un, uh, lies and pe things speak, taking people to hell? You better repent. Lord, forgive me. I repent. And I'm not doing none of that. Help me, Jesus. Entertainment replaced true worship and the altars to other gods were built and they built the shrines and the, the, to the temple prostitutes. They included the worship of Baal, Molech, Asherah, Chemosh, Astarte, and Azurah. These were all false gods, gods of fertility, gods of sexuality, god of perversion, gods of child sacrifice, and gods of prostitution. This is what was going on. And if we don't see the correlation between what I'm reading and what we see today, we are sadly mistaken. And then you're going to get these politicians up there that are murdering babies, promoting same sex, everything that contradicts the word of God, and then put a smile on your face and say, God bless you and God bless America. No, God's going to damn us if we don't get our act together and start praying and seeking his face, humbling ourselves and, and bowing to the fear of God once again like they used to in the days of old. Then we'll have the power. Then we'll see God moving. If another Christian comes up and asks me, how come God's not moving? I'm going to tell you to look in the mirror. So I'll save you the trip right now. It's easy. We all want to point the finger at everybody else while we ourselves don't do it. Look at them, Pastor. How come nobody shows up for prayer? Well, you weren't there. We'll come for chicken dinner, but we won't come to pray and seek a holy God in the midst of when our world's going to hell in a handbasket, and we ain't got time to pray, but we got time to go get entertained. I heard they ran to a Taylor Swift concert. A lot of believers went there, and I'm not against concert. You, you do what you want. But they said they slept over, and some people wore diapers because they didn't want to lose their place in line by going to the bathroom. And we can't sit in church for 10 minutes without running out that door. And we call ourselves Christians. Help us, Lord. 
It's all right. You can write a letter to the board. They can fire me. It's all right. I'll get my Bible and preach on the, on the street. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and I know what you mean, but I, I just want you to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's why we do what we do. We want to see people fall in love with God, seeing their lives transformed. Man, that's the best pastor appreciation gift I could ever have, is seeing somebody's life transformed because of the work of the ministry with all of us together, not one man. It can't be one man. It can't be one person, you know? You know the problem with a one-monkey show? When the monkey dies, the show dies. It's got to be a group. It's got to be us together. Josiah is one of two kings mentioned in the lineage of Jesus in Matthew. I thought, man, what a powerful, what a powerful, man, just statement that his, his name is included in even that. And I put, how good is God that 300 years prior to the birth of Josiah, 300 years before he was born, God prophesied, or had a prophet prophesy that he was going to be born. Let's go to 1 Kings 13, 1 through 4. 1 Kings 13, 1 through 4. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah, out of praise, by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, this is 300 years prior to Josiah's birth, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon you. And he gave a sign that same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. He's talking about these altars that were polluted. They will be burned and crushed and broken down by this Josiah. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold of him. This, this wicked king tries to lay hold of the prophet and stop him from what he's pro prophesying in God's name. He tries to grab him, and his hand gets paralyzed. It withers up. Hallelujah. Come on, man. It dried up so he could not even pull it back to himself again. He went to stop that proclamation of truth. And God withered his hand up where he couldn't even pull it back to himself. He later on begins to cry out when it happened and starts to cry to God in repentance and, and, and ask the, the, the prophet to pray for him, which he did. This prophet's not even named in here. And he started to cry out and, and the prophet started to cry out in God and God restored Jeroboam's hand for him to temporarily serve God but only later to turn back on him again. You know, when I read this scripture, I'm thinking... The mercy of God. Do we understand it's the mercy of God that we see what's going on in our country? It's supposed to make us want to cry out to God and scream for, for change, reformation, and revival in church. Judgment starts at the house of God. We're all pointing our fingers at the world saying, God, work on them, you know, destroy them, wipe them out, whatever. And God say, no, you should be praying for me to save their souls. Just like I saved yours. My will is none shall perish. But you still have to stand for truth, even when it costs you something. This young prophet speaking out, and they tried to silence him, and, and God intervened. Hallelujah. Now I'm thinking, I'm going up 300 years later. You know, 300 years prior, God knew the state of the church would be in, and yet he raised up someone who could bring truth and reformation to save them. So they didn't have to go through this. That's God's heart. He doesn't want us to go through judgment. Josiah, he's being taught, thank God, by a remnant of godly priests. He's eight years old. No one is, I'm sure, thinking he was ruling on his own at eight years old without some guidance. So he's eight years old, and there was a godly remnant of priests who took Josiah under. You don't think they knew that prophecy? And sowed into this young man's life. 
sowed into his life. And at 16 years old, this young Josiah has this personal encounter with God, this, this personal awakening in his life that just so transformed him, he got radical for God. Now he's 16 years old, and all the things that I read to you are going on. It was his father and grandfather that set up these false altars and brought in these false gods and the temple prostitutes. And all these things had been going on for so long, everybody just accepted it. Well, who am I? Who am I to change anything? Who, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that fatal thinking. At 16, he starts to have this awakening. And he starts commissioning things to start to change. Hallelujah. He had this personal reform. At 20, he begins to restore the temple. At 20 years old, the temple had been in disrepair. They let it go. They didn't pay any attention to it. And the temple is where the worship, the sacrifices, the, the encounters with God, everything took place in your relationship with God. Now we have the Holy Spirit, right? And we are the temples of God. But that temple was laid. That's why we're supposed to take care of this temple. It's the temple of God. So he starts to, to have the temple um, redone, to, to restore the temple. And they find the book of the law in the wall. Now, this is interesting because they didn't have the books of the law because his grandfather, Manasseh, started to have all the books burned, all the books of the law, all the writings, which they were scrolls at that time. He started to have all the scrolls burned because was, he was being convicted. So what does he do? He says, well, we got we to gotta take that out. We got to get rid of that, sort of like cults do. They bring in a little truth, but they get rid of the parts they don't like. Right? Come on. So he, they, they find the book of the law, and now Jewish historians believed it was the original scroll written by Moses. And that the priest, when Manasseh ordered all these things, God always has a remnant. God's always got a people, man. God's always got a group or somebody that, come on, that, that's, that's not going to bend their knee to, he's not going to bow down, not going to bend their knees to bales of this world. And so they believed, the Jewish historians believed that this was the original scroll written by the hand of Moses because those godly priests, when Manasseh ordered everything to be destroyed, he, he had the priest, they hid this in a wall at the temple. Hallelujah. So they, this, this scroll during this restoration comes out and they found it. And then you have Hilkiah was the high priest at the time and Shapin, who was the, basically the secretary of state, but he was also a scribe. And so, because Josiah surrounded himself with these people who loved the Lord, and they found the scroll and they began to read it, and they brought it to the king's attention. And they read this to the king. Now check this out in 2 Kings 22. I'm going to read verse 11, verse 13, verse 16 through 20, just for time's sake. In verse 11, and it came to pass when the king, King Josiah, heard these words. He's about 20, between 20 and 24 years old at this time. He heard the words of the book of the law that he immediately rent his robe, his royal robe. He rent it. He ripped it in humility and repentance. And the king commanded Helkiah the priest and Anakim the son of Shapin and Ab Ekor, Egbor, this is probably not saying that right, the son of Micaiah and Shapin the scribe and Azahiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go and inquire of the Lord for me. And for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Down to verse 16. Thus said the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and they have burned incense to other gods, they, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus say he say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because your heart was tender and thou hast humbled himself before the Lord. When you heardest what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become desolation and a curse, and has rent his clothes and wept before me, I have also heard thee, saith the Lord. 
God says, because his heart was tender before me, when the word was, writ- when the word was read, he, his heart was so tender towards God that he rent his robe in repentance and humility and brokenness before God. He says, Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and you shall be gathered unto thy grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see evil, which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. So they read, and basically they believe this was the book of Deuteronomy, verse, chapters 28 through 30. I would encourage every believer to read Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 30 and read it prayerfully and humbly before God. Pray before you read it, please. So King Josiah humbles himself before the Lord. And then God delays judgment, not just for him, but for the whole nation for 31 years. Do you think they were overjoyed that they had a king that was humble before God and averted judgment for all of them to enjoy peace for 31 years? And here's what God said. Because Josiah humbled himself, he would not allow Josiah to see the judgment that would be brought upon the people and the evil that was going to be allowed to take place because he was humble before the, God, before the Lord. As I said, Bible scholars believe that he read Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Every believer should read it. You know, it's all about the blessings and the curses. God says, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. It's just all flip-flopping back. And then he, in one part he says, I've given you a choice of life and death. You choose. It's up to every believer to choose for himself, to humble ourselves before God. Help us, Lord. Josiah then immediately, after it has the reading of the word, he begins to commission. The first thing he does, he has all the idols removed from the temple and burned alongside the, the altars that he broke down and removed to these false gods. He drove out all the false priests. He drove out the prostitutes and the sodomites. He destroyed the altars of Molech and stopped the shedding of innocent blood. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're almost there. Hallelujah. The overturning of Roe v. Wade, that's a gift from God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, and I I wrote this little note in my office and I said, you know, the problem with the church today is we only want to surrender our wrongs and not our rights. We're still claiming rights. We're willing to lay down the wrongs, the ones we don't like and we don't like the consequences of. But we're not willing to lay down the things that we think we have rights to, to God. We're attached to the things of this world and we've become so earthly minded we're no heavenly good. We have ignored the command that we are to be followers of Christ and that we must take up our cross every day, deny ourselves, and follow Christ and his commands. I think it was my son that said the other night in men's group, we had a powerful men's meeting talking about some of these things. I think it was my son that said, Christianity was never about self-preservation, but a call to self-denial. That's what it's about. It's not about claiming any rights. It's about dying to self and taking up the cross of Christ and putting to death the deeds of the flesh. I got in my office as I was laying out this message and I was just so brokenhearted before God saying, God, forgive us. Sometimes I say, God, why are you calling me to say this stuff? Because I know the flack that I'll take. But that's okay. God's worth it. Nothing compared to what he took. Amen. And I wrote down just some of the things I prayed. I said, God, help me to abandon myself at the reading of your word to bring about a reformation in my life that could spark others to do the same to return to the truth of God's word. And here's the thing, church, revival has to start with you. We're looking for someone else. 
We're looking, you know, and I was even tempted myself to say, God, you know, I started praying, God, just can, raise up another Josiah. And God said, it's not about raising up a single Josiah. It's about raising up my bride. It's about all my bride coming together and all of my bride being Josiah's, having that heart of Josiah. We're so, you know, we, we looked at Trump's not the answer, church. Joe Biden's not the answer for this mess. The answer is Christ and his bride. That's what he's called us to do. It's not any of these politicians. They're not going to fix They're the ones that broke it. Why are we looking to them to fix it? I love it. They, they destroy stuff, and then they run on this platform to fix the, God, the stuff that they created. And people just go, oh, yeah, I'll vote for him. Yeah, he's going to give me a freebie. I don't want your stinking freebies. I don't need a freebie. I got God. Hallelujah. He said he'll meet my needs according to his riches and glory. I'm not looking to the government to meet my needs. I'm looking to my God. He fed prophets with, with uh, manna from birds, man. Come on. He brought the ravens, brought them meat to, to the prophet. We need the government? They can't do nothing right. Amen? Come on. For the most part, they're all a bunch of crooks, both sides, all three sides, Republican, Democrat, Independent. Come on, man. We, we just got to start being honest and real. We need a clean sweep. We need some godly people, man, to be put in these offices and change this thing around, man. And I mean God. I'm trusting God, not people. Hallelujah. Revival has to start with you. And true revival doesn't end with you. It ends going out to a lost world and seeing people giving their hearts to Jesus Christ. We think revival is having a Holy Ghost a set of meetings that the Holy Ghost ran and really moved in church, but it never got outside the doors. If all this newfangled stuff was working, we'd see a greater evangelism across America, and that's not what we're seeing. God says you'll know it by the fruit. Here's my prayer. My prayer. God, bend us to your ways to the point that we break and die to self. Well, when I got up, get up, it's no longer I who live like the Apostle Paul wrote. It's Christ who lives within me. Help us, Lord. They didn't walk in the power of God because they lost their first love. We say, God, how come I'm not seeing this? How come I'm not seeing that? And God's saying, because you lost your first love. What is your greatest passion? Here's something else God showed me in my prayer, and I know it's God. Church, if the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and others as yourself, then the greatest sin must be not to. I know that was God. I wouldn't have thought of it. I'm not that smart. You know what's interesting? Out of this reformation, you know, reformation is nothing more than a returning to truth. We already know the truth. We just got to return to it. Stop playing this mamby-pamby Christianity, weak, crying, whiny stuff, man, and make a difference. Come on, man, it's the truth. Christians complain more than people in the world. Out of this revival came some interesting people. Out of this revival, a young man started to preach at the age of 14 years old named Jeremiah, named, known as the weeping prophet, 14 years old. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all teenagers came out of this reformation of Josiah. This next group of leaders that would be used to bring them out of the Babylonian captivity and lead the way. Young teenagers who were thrown in, uh, threatened to be thrown in a furnace and actually were, but, but had the audacity and the courage because they had a passion for God more than they had for anything else, even life, and said, O king, although God allow you to slay us, we will not bow down nor serve you because we serve one, hallelujah, my God. And that God showed up in the furnace when they turned it up to as hot as they could get it to the point it even burned up the people that threw them in. And yet they were in there dancing with the fourth man. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Church, we got to get our faith, man. We got to get our faith directed to the right place. Stop looking to other stuff and look to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. 
young teenagers. You know, I got so convicted, I'm thinking, these are teenagers. This is an eight-year-old boy that starts to reign and starts to make reformation in Judah, the place of praise. So I thought all these teenagers that God was raising up, I said, what's, what's our excuse? We should know better. We should know more. And more than what's our excuse, what will be our response? What will be your response? Because that's up to you. Now, I'm going to close with this verse, and then I'm going to ask God to help me pray. But I'm going to give you two verses. What can we do? That judgment was averted because somebody looked up the Scripture and saw this. If my people... That's a condition to be met. If is a conditional word. If my people, which are called by my name. You know, do you, do you have other groups of people saying the sovereignty of God, and God does studs with you? No, no, God has put conditions. And says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear in heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And my eyes shall be open unto you. That's a condition to be met. If my people, he says, humble themselves, pray, and seek not my power, not my mighty works, but seek my face. You know, when God says seek my face, he's saying seek my heart. I'm going to close with this verse and we're going to pray. Mark 7, verses 16. And before I read this, I'm just going to say a few things here. If you're angry with me, this will apply to you. If you're holding bitterness, unforgiveness, it's going to apply to you. If you're critical and judgmental and pointing the finger at everybody else, this is going to apply to you. If you're interested and you're making excuses, this is going to apply to you. Apply to you, excuse me. Mark 7, 16, and God said this same phrase in many places in the scripture, and he said it to the churches in Revelation. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Father, we just come to you today. God, I pray that I just did what you called me to do. Father, I didn't mean to come across angry or bitter or, or mad at the world. And I pray your heart was seen. God, I pray that you'll be able, you'll do what you do. You're able to do more than able. That God, that you can touch hearts and humble us before you. That God, that we would walk in the joy of the Lord because we're surrendered. Our hearts are broken before a holy God. That once again your church will be at the altars crying out for the lost of this world. I see a, a man named Saul who was killing Christians. And I thought if he was alive today, how would we pray for Saul? Lord, a lot of the church would be praying and I might have been joining them in if I was watching Fox News every day or CNN. Kill him. Take him out. He's evil. And the whole time, God's heart would be broken. Saying, no, I want to save him. I want to use him. I want to use him. I want to show you. He's going to know what it means to be a follower of me. And God raised that murderous man up to write at least 13 books of the scriptures, of the holy scriptures, the Bible. He brought revival in the land. He's encouraged us today as much as any other writer in the Bible. And he was someone that everybody else counted out. Well, God, save the Republicans, save the Democrats, save the senators, the, save the congressmen, save the president, save them all, Lord. Save them, God. But in the meantime, Lord, we still got to do what we're called to do. You said go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, meeting the needs of the poor, taking that drink to that one that's thirsty, meeting those that are in prison, you remember Jesus said, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. You didn't visit me when I was in prison. 
You didn't bring me a drink when I was thirsty or feed me when I was hungry. And, and he goes down to start, read the book of Matthew, 20, the later chapters, 24, 25. And they said, Lord, when did we not do this? He said, because you never, the, the least, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. You saw the need, you knew it was there, but you never met it. You never showed him my love. You never spoke about me because you were ashamed. You were afraid of what they would think or say. And now I'm ashamed of you before my father. Turn from me, you wicked servant. I've never knew you. And they'll begin to proclaim, God, I taught Sunday school. I'm paraphrasing. God, we'll start to give our, our spiritual qualifications and res our spiritual resume. And it's not going to hold any water away. God says, I'm humble and a contrite heart. I'll no way despise. So God, touch us today. Bend us towards your will. Crush us. Crush us, oh God. Crush this old man. Crush that old woman. Crush this old way of thinking, God. Crush the things we're trusting in. Crush the things we're self-medicating with because we're not happy. So we're turning to all these other things instead of turning to Christ because he's my everything. He's more than enough. Hallelujah. He said, I'll meet every need according to his riches in glory. So God, today, I pray, Lord, it says your word doesn't return void but accomplishes that which you set it to do. So, Lord, I pray I see the fruit of your word, not mine. My words are, mean, mean nothing unless they're birth of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray not for the flattery, the accolades, or even the hate mail. I pray for you to be exalted. I pray for you to be loved and adored the way you deserve. I pray one day this house will be filled with worshipers from the balcony out through here. We have to keep the doors open, people in the hallways all bend their knees before a holy God, crying out and worshiping the way he deserves to be worshiped, God, without any prompting of man, but because our hearts have been bent towards you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have your way right now, God. I pray the spirit, God, of, of repentance, Father God, and brokenness to go through not just new life, but every one of your embassies that names themselves a church of God. And that, Lord, that we would emerge from our knees refreshed and ready for battle to do your will, to go out and find somebody to love on with the love of Jesus Christ, unashamed, as Paul wrote, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The first the Jew and then the Greek, that all the world may know. To live is Christ, to die is gain. But in the meantime, it's Christ who lives within me. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. God, that it all come back to you in the form of glorious praise, God and worship, for you deserve it. And we give you all the praise this morning. I'm going to ask those on the prayer team to come forward. If anyone in here needs to, to be agreement of prayer for any need, or a need for someone else, you want to stand in the gap. Or if you just want to come to the altar and kneel down. In fact, if you come up and kneel at the altar, nobody on the praise team, I don't want anybody praying for anyone that's kneeled at the altar. They're spending time with God. We, we don't want to interrupt that. There's nothing we can do greater than what God's going to do. So, Father, have your way right now. And, Father, for those, I know people have to go to work. They have responsibilities, things that they've committed to. I pray for them right now, God. Give travel and mercies. Bless, bless this body, God, as we surrender to you. Raise up. You said my house should be called the house of prayer. God, may this house become a house of prayer. Have your way. Touch, move, bless, change, equip, reform, refresh, revive. In your holy name we pray. And we pray for the lost. We pray for the broken. We pray for the downtrodden. We pray for the weak. We pray for the small. That God, today they'd be touched. Touched with your love. 
We pray for those caught up in sin. I pray for those caught up in homosexuality, transgenderism, adultery, fornication, drugs, alcohol abuse. God, we, we pray for them. Those who've been broken, hurt, those who've been wounded as children and are carrying these things through their life, we pray for them right now for a release. I pray for those who have loved ones who have passed on to be with you. I pray for comfort in their hearts right now, God. And any other sin, any other, uh, Lord, that, that anyone is dealing with, Lord, hurt, pain, sin, we pray right now, comfort, peace, before a holy God. Have your way. Have your way. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for that one that was wounded as a child, molested, hurt, Lord, by someone they trusted. God, I pray right now, healing. I pray for those who are holding unforgiveness and bitterness. I pray right now, right now, be broken in the name of Jesus. And listen, I know if you have to go, you got work or whatever, you go ahead. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna obey God right now. Hallelujah. Got somebody that's been deeply wounded in their heart or soul trying to shake it. It's caused them to, to go to other things. I pray healing right now. I pray release right now in Jesus' name. Somebody caught up in a sin and said, I keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, and I'm not getting free. God, give them a distaste for it right now. Give them a distaste for it. Make it hurt when we want to do something that contradicts your word so we can be positioned to receive your best because we serve a God that wants to forgive, that wants to bring mercy. God, thank you, Lord. Have your way in this house today for your glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God.